So first thing is, you know, these new objects are popping up around every day, right? What you see here on the screen are, I guess, talkative samples of, you know, who's marketing this stuff. You can today go to an IKEA store and buy not just, you know, chairs and tables, but also PV kits, right? So for you as an individual, it's, it's great. You know, EVs, heat pumps, all of these PVs, very nice. But for you as a utility, it's a bit tricky, right? So how do you manage this? And the very first question on this first slide is, are you just in the loop? Are you just informed every time a PV is installed on your grid? Are you just informed of you know, how many EVs are sold? Are you informed when you know, a new EV charging station is there? And are you in the loop of all this process, the connection process? You know, sometimes it's the retailer who's selling the solar panel, so is he putting you in the loop of this? The information he grabs is maybe in a CIS system somewhere. Does he send this information to you? Is it the right information? Is it accurate? Sometimes it's an aggregator who is actually, you know, marketing these home energy management systems. And by the way, it's putting in a heat pump or a PV or an EV or whatever else. Are you in the loop of this? Do you know? Where is it captured? Is it the right data? If you want to do something with these guys later on in your process, you need to have some technical information, right? It's a PV. That's the size. That's maybe the technology. And, you know, the inverter that is attached to it has such and such characteristics. It can be controlled with this mode and that mode. And I can, you know, send a control to change the mode, maybe, etc. You know, do you have all this information? Maybe as a start, it's good enough to know that there is a PV there, and that maybe the size is this or that, right? But you know, as awareness is something, then you will like to control. So how do you harness all this information that you will need to control these guys? Technical information, yeah, and also commercial information. You know, if it's an aggregator who marketed that stuff and installed it, and actually it did that on purpose because he wanted to sell services, and he wanted to get the data and to sell the data and do something out of it, you need to know the name of that aggregator. Are you in that loop? Do you know what's the name of the aggregator? Do you have a contact person to, you know, to lie with and say, okay, you install this and that solar panels and inverters and whatever, and I would like to deal with you because me, as a utility, I want to harness these guys. You know, so there's a lot of process ongoing with all of this. And CIS and GIS, so that ultimately it gets into your ADMS. So that was the first aspect of it. Now, the second step is, you know, what are these DRs causing troubles on the grid? So there's all literature on this, of course. So now the impacts are known, right? At the distribution level, it's backfeeds, it's voltage troubles. At the transmission level, it's balancing issues. And by the way, this will come at the interface between transmission and distribution, so you need to take care of this also. And sit maybe with your TSO to, to learn about these impacts and coordinate. So this is a good example of you know, what can happen in an area where there's a lot of PVs. So it's actually in Europe, in Germany, so the south of Germany, as you may know, is a very high PV region, something like California. And so that's a graph that shows you know, the flow at the interconnection between transmission and distribution. So that's the flow at the primary substation. So what you see here on the top is all the times when the flow is the normal direction, meaning it goes down from transmission to distribution. And what you see below the green curve here, the green curve is zero. What you see here at the bottom is all the instances when the flow was the reverse direction. So actually going up from distribution to transmission. So not only do you see that it's very frequent, but also you see that sometimes the absolute value of the flow is great and greater than the normal that it should be. So what that means is that 
you know, the transformer that sees this flow is used to having a flow that direction and that does not hit more than that blue line here. And now we see flows in the opposite direction and that just over the capacity of the rating of the transformer, plus all the protection issues that this may cause, etc. So that's the type of things that happen. So maybe you're not there yet as a utility. There is just so much PV on your grid today. You're not Bavaria, you're not California yet, right? But this will come. So you'd better prepare, maybe, right? And preparing is kind of knowing what happens and, and also all the processes and the logics attached to it, you know? You're used to running your grid knowing that voltage drops. Of course, voltage drops. Well, no longer. Voltage drops just so long as there is not PV, and when it's PV, there's a rise. And so you have a profile of voltage that is just not the regular stuff you would. So in all your daily operator routines, you need to think differently, right? So do you know the impact? Do you have a sense? Do you start to see the impact in some of the neighborhoods that you have, some regions, some parts of your grid? Do you have visibility on this? Then the next question is, you know, I know there is impact. Do I start to feel it? And can I leave stuff happening like this without intervention? without trying to guide where can I accept more PV, where can I accept more residential batteries or whatever. You know, you may want to sit with the aggregators, the retailers, and, and really understand, you know, what, what are your plans? Where are you marketing your stuff? You know, please don't go this area because I've got big congestion issues already, and, and so don't, don't go there. You know, why not? So you need kind of planning tools to make sure that you're aware of where you stand as, as of now, how many PVs there are region-wise, feeder-wise, et cetera, and how long can this last? How long can people go to IKEA store and just put that on the rooftop without you knowing about it? Then you say, okay, I, I know the errors are popping up. I know I can still handle it here and there. But now I know that I need to model these objects so that ultimately I can control them and, you know, inside my daily operation routine, so within the ADMS ultimately. So I want to model these objects, right? So these are samples of, you know, views of what it takes or how it looks like to model these objects, right? Within your ADMS today, you've got all nice models for what a transformer is about, what the breaker is about, what the line is about. You've got all types of settings for the parameters and such. So do you have the same in your IDMS today to model a battery, to model PV, to model a heat pump, to model a smart inverter? You know, that's a typical PV site. Where you've got a range of PVs, you've got battery, you've got a breaker, you've got a smart inverter. No. How do you model this? Is your ADMS ready to do this? It's just a right click and, you know, I'm choosing that object and I've got all the parameters already set. I just need to fill in. And by the way, I can grab that automatically from the GIS because I did the job to lies with the retailer, etc., etc. And then, you know, I can have the, so the static information, the static model, that's fine. Then I would like to have at least a profile of what would be the output of that PV site, for instance. So it can be a static profile, but look what, what happens in real life. That's just, you know, typical PV site during a cloudy day. Cloud comes, in a second, the output of the PV goes from 80% to 10%. See the shape? So if what you have in the ADMS is a model that makes just this nice curve here, well, you're missing some of the truth, right? So when do you need to refine this model? Can you nurture it with all the history data that you're grabbing? Does it take, you know, to work on your smart mirroring data, do some analytics to, you know, kind of refine the model? Can you get monitoring 
actually out of this. So this is really a path, a journey, right? So yes, you're not Bavaria, California yet, maybe, but you need to start on this. There's a hell lot of a job to do. Next question is, okay, I model these guys. But you know, by the way, my daily job is, you know, fault location, isolation, service restoration. So how does that work when there are PVs around? I want to re-energize a feeder, so I'm sending crews to the field, they need to act on some breakers and some set. Am I sure that on that feeder line there is not a PV connected there that is actually still energizing the feeder? So within the process of restoring your fault, is there a step somewhere that I'm checking these type of things linked to DERs? Now when I'm running some uh, optimization on my grid, like VVC, like power flow, optimum power flow, et cetera, are these algorithms able to take into account the fact that there can be back feeds, like we've seen in Bavaria, or that the, you know, that the voltage is not just decreasing, but sometimes increasing again? Are these algorithms ready for this? You know, so what you need is a DR ready ADMS, right? just like the already GIS, as we were saying before. And so that's, for instance, a result of a power flow routine that was actually running in a field where there was PVs and inverters and that was well taken into account. But there's some background work to have these algorithms ready for this. Okay. So, Analysis is something, but control is the next thing. So control we mentioned when, you know, fleezer routine, for instance. But you may want to act on these DRs also to solve congestion issues, voltage troubles, and all of these. And so, so you know, these are new objects. So when it takes controlling, it's always more tricky and you ask more questions than about monitoring, right? So what if I press the button? Can I get what really I expect to get? Would I get it? What if I don't? What's the backup plan? Can I, you know, your traditional levers are yours, right? It's breaker that your team's installed, that you've been commissioning, you're doing the, you know, the point-to-point -point checking that all the telecoms were fine, etc., etc. It's reliable to trust when you press the button. Here, when it's starting to, you know, to act on a smart inverter through an aggregator, well, yeah, we need to work beforehand, right? To be sure that when I press this, this is what I get. So, so actually you need to, you know, to sit with aggregators. You will never be able to, <coughs> to really model, monitor and control all of these single devices, you know, Having them model at a certain level is fine. When it takes controlling, you will not optimize all your controls saying that giving a set point for every PV site, right? Saying, Mr. A, please turn your inverter down, you know, 10% and Mr. B. When you've got millions of PV sites, you will not optimize all of these, right? So you need to group them. And that's really the goal of an aggregator. The aggregator, more of the time, is there because he's answering to an energy efficiency target, right? He's making, selling some energy efficiency services. He's got a microgrid where he invested some PV, some battery. So he wants to optimize all of this and the lifespan of his investment, etc. But, you know, you can ask him to, you know, to change the setting of all of this and, you know, to sell you flexibility. So you as a grid uh, operator, you want to ask for flexibility for your grid standpoint. And him, it's like, okay, I can you know, change the way I'm running my assets so that I can provide this flexibility. And, and then you end up saying, okay, uh, I've got this new lever in my portfolio, which is acting on flexibility from the DR through an aggregator, or maybe for a big battery that'd be mine. I've got that directly in the SCADA, but, but still it's, 
you still got your traditional levers. You still got your switchings, you still got your gaps, taps, you know, voltage regulators and all of this. So, so how do you manage that fleet ultimately? And so, you know, in a typical single light diagram like, like this, you see that you've got several options. So then comes the question of the merit order, you know, of these DRs. Do you want to call them often? In which circumstances? Is there, you know, a, a typical routine that you will say, I will first act on my switching. If this is not enough, I will play with taps and caps. And if it's not enough, I will play maybe with these DRs, but just as a last resort. Or, or do you want to have them higher in the merit order? And so we touched already on this, how you can procure flexibility from the aggregators. And you know, there's a contractual aspect of it that, that needs to be addressed. We said you sit with these guys and you agree on how you interface and it takes some protocols like IEEE 20.5 and this type of things, right? But there is, a, you know, how, what's the price for it? So either you have a bilateral contract with them saying, okay, that's the price I will buy you flexibility every time I will call you. So that's, that's fixed. But in some uh, regions and markets and regulations, this can actually be market-based. And every day, you know, DSO, maybe TSO also saying that's the flexibility that I would like. And, you know, and flexibility trades between the aggregators and the BRPs and et cetera. And the aggregators answering to this. But, you know, there needs to be a routine so that, so that this makes financial sense for all the actors involved, meaning you and the aggregators, right? And so this is a sample, and we'll see on, on the demo, if you see the demo afterwards, is, you know, of, of how do you value the use of flexibility? You know, how much does it save on the problems that it's supposed to solve versus the cost that it has? And so you can really price this lever as another lever. Which leads to the conclusion, which is, you know, so DRs are, are there, you know, we won't change that, and they're actually growing at a pace you cannot control. You will not prevent people from running into these IKEA stores and having the nice, cool PV kit. So you need to do something with it. And we touched on the fact that it takes quite a lot of steps, right? And what we believe ultimately is that if you think of it, I mean, these are, you know, if you want to act on a battery that, that is uh, flexibility provided by an aggregator who has the, all this spark of residential batteries aggregated, it has technical constraints because a battery is a, a stock that you need to manage, the ramp up, etc. constraint that you need to take into account. So that's technical constraint, but the same like when you're acting on a switch, right? When you, you know, calling some demand response, it have maybe a snapback effect, etc. You know, a little like when you're acting on a cat bank that you have, you know, you can no longer use it for s some time. So, so same type of technical constraints. And cost-wise, yes, it takes something to buy flexibility, but when using your asset, there's some wear and tear implications of this, and, and the scenario of not doing anything has a cost also. So ultimately, you've got you know, your switches, caps, taps, voltage regulators, whatever level, and DR is another level. Your DR or the third party DR, and that's, that's the way we want to run the grid, so that ultimately it'd be transparent for you. So that's what I had. Uh, I hope it was interesting, and would like to have the exchange now, and if you want to know more, the demo is there so that we walk you through the steps of what we have to to manage these DRs. Thank you.